Well, good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from World Literature Today at the University of Oklahoma. My name is Daniel Simon. I'm the Editor-in-Chief here at WLT, and I'm really delighted to have with me today Carlos Hill, who is Professor of African and African American Studies here at OU and Chair of the Clara Lupa, Clara Lupa Department of African and African American Studies, and he also teaches history here at OU. And we're here to talk about his new book called The Murder of Emmett Till, and it just came out within the past few weeks from Oxford University Press, and we're just doing a, a book chat about the book and um, just to, to give it a sense, to give us a, a little bit of a historical perspective. This week marks the 65th anniversary of Emmett Till's murder in Mississippi in 1955. So we're coming up on a, a milestone moment in, uh, in American history that I think it's worth reflecting on. So we're going to chat a little bit and, and I'll ask a few questions and, and Dr. Hill, uh, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's really my pleasure. So let's um, just talk a little bit about the context of the book. It, the Murder of Emmett Till is part of Oxford University Press's graphic history series. And what can we learn from the graphic history genre about the Emmett Till story that is maybe different from other accounts of his murder? Yeah, I mean, just in general, uh, the Oxford graphic history series is about trying to engage undergraduate students in new ways. Um, undergraduates have to take history courses they have to take introductory history courses, typically um, as a part of a graduation requirement. And so Oxford knew from uh, survey data that students hate uh, reading textbooks mm -hmm. um, to learn about history. Mm -hmm. um, but students typically love um, visual, more visual histories. And given the fact that we live in a culture that's saturated with media and, and video and just imagery, um, I think Oxford, I won't say stumbled upon, but they uh, experimented initially with um, trying to create a format for history that would be engaging for students given the times. And so they produced in 20, I wanna say 2005, 2005, I'm slipping on the dates. Um, actually, it was more like 20, 2012, 2013. They created a BINA, uh, which is a, a, a graphic history on, on uh, sort of slavery in Africa. Um, and it was told by a female narrator, Abina. And it was an amazing success. And they realized that they had something. Mm -hmm. And so shortly, shortly, after that, I approached Oxford about writing about Till because it's the 60th anniversary uh, of the murder was was coming up in 2015, and and the editor and I talked about sort of a traditional text, um, and they kind of he kind of said, yeah, I really want to publish this, but then came back to me uh, about a month later and said, hey, I really want you to consider a graphic history because Abina is doing wildly, it's just wildly successful. And it would be great if we could um, really um, begin or have an African-American component to this, to this series. And so what do you think about a graphic history and the Emmett Till murder? And I was like, uh, I can't draw. Um, I'm not a, <laughs> I, I, I have no experience doing this. I, I mean, I just, I just don't know. And then with, I, and I started to wonder would this even count for a tenure and promotion committee, you know, as a, as, as a second book, but, you know, I thought about it and I, and, but finally I was like, you know, when am I ever going to get an opportunity to do a, a book like this and, you know, and with the support of Oxford university press. And so I said, yes. And, you know, we had hope for the book to come out in 2015 and five years later, <laughs> it's out, um, you know, and, you know, but I think I needed the time uh, in order to really digest, fully digest the story uh, and to figure out how to render it uh, in a way that would be compelling. And so I think the, the key for this book is, um, 
and what makes it maybe different from other accounts and maybe provides a deeper understanding than other accounts is I was really forced to think about and think carefully about um, how Emmett Till sounded, like the words that he used, hmm. um, how he moved through the world, how he engaged with others. Uh, I was forced to really center him and, and transform him into an agent in his story versus an object in his story. Hmm. And, and I think that's what I tried to do um, th at least throughout the first half of the graphic history when it's centered upon, you know, the actions that lead up to his murder. Um, I really wanted him to be an agent. Um, I didn't want it to be minimally about him and what was what the what the book what the graphic history is really about is the actions of others or, or the actions that came after him mm -hmm. or after his death. And so for me that's um that's what makes it a little bit different um, is that I try to, given the format, um, I'm, I'm able to kind of help readers to get to understand who he was in life. Um, how, you know, the, the ways in which he was a prankster and he was a jokester and he had a zest for life and he was a courageous young man and a deeply empathetic uh, young man, um, you know, and who was beloved by you know, his friends and his family. Um, and so that's what I hope um, students who encounter the book or others who who happen upon it, um, they will, one of the things that they'll take away from it. And just thinking about the objectification of Till, um, of course there's the famous black and white photo that, of Till's body in the casket and, you know, at the funeral in Chicago, that, uh, how Mamie Till decided to keep the casket open so that the world could see um, how his lynched body, his um, his tortured body, you know, his murdered body. So and you include that in your documents section of the book, but this kind of visual storytelling approach really brings to life, as you say, his character throughout the, the graphic history. So I'm, I really appreciate how you, you've done that for for so many of us who maybe only could think of the story in terms of that one black and white photo mm -hmm. before. So thank you for, for doing that. And just to talk a little bit more about your ideal audience, you know, in terms of the college age students who are, who are coming to this story for the first time, what would you say would be the biggest takeaway that you'd like to see young adults come away with um, after engaging with your book? That's a hard one, uh, Daniel. Um, I would say that, you know, when I, when I started this book, we weren't quite in the era of Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you know, five years later, you know, Black Lives Matter is a, a slogan heard around the world. And I think, you know, the murder of Trayvon Martin um, was the beginnings of that. And, you know, we've seen this Black Lives Matter social movement only grow since and become this, you know, international political force. Um, Emmett Till had the same kind of impact on the civil rights generation. Mm -hmm. Many people um, uh, you know, refer to themselves as the Emmett Till generation because his death had such an impact on them and spurred them to get involved in the civil rights activism of that, of that time. And so Till had a galvanizing impact on the early civil rights movement, just like, um, um, uh, I'm slipping on his name now, I just said it, um, not Tamir Rice, not Michael Brown, but Trayvon, uh, Trayvon Martin, thank you. Yeah. Um, it had a, Emmett Till had a similar galvanizing effect as say Trayvon Martin mm -hmm. had on the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and so what I would, what I would maybe, what I would want um, 
you know, students who are encounter it or lay people who encounter it to sort of take away from it is that, um, you know, black people have been victims of terrorist violence, white supremacist violence for decades, for generations. Till is one example of that. Um, Trayvon Martin is an example of that. Michael Brown is an example of that. Um, there are numerous examples. And so um, the Till case is, is a reminder that, you know, I think we haven't, we, we still live in an age where Black people are victimized by terrorist violence. Uh, we focused our focus mostly on police violence or police brutality, mm -hmm. but um, but but there are numerous uh, incidents of, of of just private violence against black bodies. Ahmaud Aubrey is probably the best known case at the moment, mm -hmm. but there are many others like Ahmaud Aubrey that never make the news. We never hear about uh, that get filed away in police reports or maybe not at all. And so Till's case is probably the best known case of you know racialized violence against particularly against a, 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 an African American youth, um, but I would even probably say an African American person. Um, you know when you give when when given the fact that there's so many poems and short stories and allusions to Emmett Till movies documentaries um, that have you know newspaper articles that have been written about uh, the case. Um, it's hard to imagine another case that has had such a, um, an impact on, on the culture. Um, but still, we are where we are. <laughs> and, you know, we, you know, there were, you know, organizations and activists who fought to get justice for Till. And there's never been justice for Emmett Till. No one connected to his murder his kidnapping has ever been held accountable. And it, 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 I mean, his case shows us, you know, and there were, you know, powerful organizations arrayed to try to get justice for Till and it never happened. And even in, in recent years, the FBI has investigated um, and try to find, you know, individuals who may have been connected to it, who are still alive. And, you know, and that effort went nowhere. Mm -hmm. And so for Till Justice, it appears that justice is going to be permanently uh, delayed. And um, I think his case helps us to understand in this moment, right, where we are clamoring for, we are agitating for justice for victims of police brutality. Till's case reminds us how long the fight has been, how difficult the fight is to get justice in just one case, let alone all the various cases in, in, this, in this country. And so it's a, it's, it's, his story is certainly sobering, um, you know, because if, if, if a 14 year old boy who did nothing can't uh, get justice, his family, loved ones can't get justice. Um, it, 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 it doesn't bode well for other cases. Um, that are much more complex, um, where uh, things can be, you know, police actions or citizens' actions can be explained away. Um, if he can't get justice, who can? And so it's a sobering reminder how far we still have to go. Indeed, indeed. Just thinking about one of the stated goals of the series. Um, they talk about introducing students to the ways that historians construct the past. And in the documents uh, section, which is really a remarkable work of scholarship, by the way, it's uh, congratulations on what you've done there. Um, did you feel like you had to deconstruct the received narrative around Till's murder in order to reconstruct it differently? 
You know, my, my work on Till is based on, um, you know, years of teaching Till in the classroom and conversations with students, uh, literature, uh, fictional literature that I've read that helped me to imagine what it would have been like, um, you know, and particularly Lewis Nordan's Wolf Whistle is, is, a is a great book to help that, that helped me to imagine what happened and, and what it would have felt like to be Emmett Till um, uh, during this, during this, uh, you know, his kidnapping and, and eventually his, his murder. Um, but to say all that is to say that, you know, my work is really built on the work of other, you know, Hill, Till historians, uh, scholars, um, and part of the difficulty for me um, in do in writing this book is that there are there is a kind of an established narrative of what occurred or what we believe to have occurred mm -hmm. um, based on available evidence. Um, but then there's just a lot that we don't know. There's a lot that we will never know. We don't know what happened to you know in the moments after Till is kidnapped from J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant. We don't know, um, we, we don't know what happened inside of uh, the barn in which, you know, J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant uh, were interrogating him uh, and beating him, um, you know, to try to force some sort of confession from him. Um, we don't know what happened, uh, you know, between the time that they killed him and, you know, his body is thrown, tossed into the Tallahatchie River. And so um, there was a lot that we believe we know based on, you know, documentary accounts, uh, but there's a lot that we didn't know. And what I, what I was afraid of, uh, quite honestly, was deviating too much um, or taking too much liberty in imagining what likely happened, right? In those blind spots, in those, in those, in those spots where we, we know very little or nothing at all. Because I didn't want, I wanted to make sure that, um, you know, the book could be viewed as a work of scholarship and history and not a uh, semi-historical account of his murder. And so I tried to stick as close as possible to um, eyewitness testimony, rem uh, oral history, remembrances, as well as, you know, um, um, educated guesses, educated speculation about what most likely happened. And so, um, you know, the book is kind of uh, an amalgam of, of all of that. And, um, you know, the, the places where um, I, I, I'm really most proud of is the weaving into the, the, the story um, experiences that, um, you know, his cousins remembered about the, moment, the, the days before he was, he was murdered, weaving those into the story to give again, till um, personality to get, you know, to make him a 3D figure um, and to, to essentially to bring him to life for the audience, not just sort of, you know, uh, what could have happened that I wanted to avoid was just sort of very quickly moving into the murder and then spending the time talking about the trial, talking about um, the activism, talking about, um, you know, what happened in the decades afterwards. Um, I really wanted to balance it between, you know, you know, the decision to come to Mississippi, you know, and, and just his energy and, you know, that is expressed and sort of trying to petition his mom uh, to, to come to Mississippi um, and, and, and just all of that to get to know Kind of who he was um, and his confidence uh, as a human being 
Um, all that I, I hope came through, but to be honest, just to answer your question more precisely, um, you know, I, for the most part, rely on the kind of established narrative of what occurred. Um, but in, in certain places, I try to expand the narrative um, by, you know, helping the audience to understand aspects of, of his time in Mississippi that were not re really reported on um, but that family members talked about. And so the instance where Till lights a firecracker in money, that was something that so stirred them that he, they go inside, you know, the candy store with them because they remembered what he had done just the day before. And so that's just a little thing, just a little story that um, helped shed light on kind of he was a prankster mm -hmm. uh, and he was from Chicago and that made them a little nervous that made them kind of uh, nervous about him interacting with white people in this in you know in the delta who would not take kindly and did not take kindly mm -hmm. to jokes pranks uh, anything that seemingly transgressed the racial etiquette of the South could be met with violence. And so um, that, that little story that reveals aspects of his personality helped me to just tell the story just a bit differently um, and, you know, in terms of how they responded to, um, to to him going into the store and then definitely when, when uh, Carolyn Bryan walks out and he whistles, you know, and, and, and they, and they flee. So, um, yeah, no, that, that's, that's, that's what I would say is that I, I, for the most part, stay faithful to the, to the narrative. Um, but in, in particular spots, there's just these little nuances that I try to add to add texture to the storytelling. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the historical context section of the book, which is part two, you tell this, you offer this marvelous context for understanding just what was happening in the summer of 55 in the South in terms of voter registration and, and kind of this long um, lead up through the Jim Crow era into um, you know, maybe the red summer of 1919 and, and in this post-war era, some of the tensions that were already in place in, in uh, Mississippi and elsewhere in the, in the South um, at the time. And of course, later on that year, we have the Montgomery bus boycott and, mm -hmm. and other events. So even by the mid fifties, uh, kind of the nascent civil rights movement is, is happening um, in, a, in a very decisive way. I'm really interested in your approach as a historian to visual storytelling and, and visual analysis of, of uh, American history. You have three books, Beyond the Rope, which is a, a book about lynching, now with the Emmett Till book. Um, and you also have a forthcoming book on the Tulsa Race Mask Massacre, which is a photographic history. And could you talk a little bit about what led you to this approach to history? and and even looking at 2020, is there kind of a singular image, you know, going back to what you were saying about Trayvon Martin and Ahmaud Aubrey, um, is there a, a photograph or an image that stands out to you as kind of being a defining um, image yeah. for our times? Now, that's a wonderful question. Uh, you just giving me all these wonderful questions, Daniel. Um, you know, uh, I, I can't take any great credit for, you know, you know, in, envisioning doing history with, um, um, with, um, you know, at, in the visual register. Um, I kind of stumbled into it. Um, you know, it began with Oxford inviting me to do this graphic history and challenging me uh, to do this, this graphic history. Um, and then from there, uh, you know, coming to OU, 
had no plans to write about the Tulsa race massacre until I came to OU and, you know, deciding that um, how can I creatively convey um, that this, what occurred in 1921, May 31st, June 1st, 1921 was not a race riot. It was a massacre. It, it, it struck me that because there was such an archive of photographs, I could tell that I could, I could capture people through those powerful photographs in ways that a more traditional history, history could not, uh, even with evenly powerfully written. Um, and so, you know, the, the key difference between, and this is an obvious difference, um, but the key difference is in, in traditional academic histories or just histories in general, you tell a story with words and you have to choose your words wisely and judiciously in order to convey the, the, the meaning, right, that you want. In visual histories, whether they're graphic or photographic, um, the images tell the story, right? The renderings tell the story, right? And the words are just there to support it, right? If you can't understand the story, if you stripped away the text and you couldn't understand the story from the imagery, then the images, the images are not um, doing the story justice, right? Mm -hmm. um, you should be able to look at the images as well as the renderings and, and, and be able to understand the flow of the narrative or what the narrative is. And so that's the challenge um, is not to it's not a story, it's not a graphic history, it isn't a story, uh, are, 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 you know, illustrations with words. I mean, they, it truly is about the illustrations. And that's why uh, the selection of artists is so important. That's why work, the, the work between the author and the illustrator is so important because um, you have, the, the author has to really, um, you know, uh, spend a lot of time with the illustrator talking about what exactly needs to be rendered, how it needs to be rendered, how it needs to feel when you, when, when, when the audience reads it, sees it. Um, it's a, just a, it's, it's a different talent um, and a different set of concerns. Um, you know, and so one of the challenges is with, with Nim and Till book, um, you know, we're, we're, this is a, a book for undergraduates and you want to make sure you know even within the the graphic history portion that you're providing enough context you're providing enough um uh, enough stage direction to help them to understand it and so you know i probably wrote too much text and too much captioning because i was concerned about making sure that you know this this undergraduate reader who may or may or may not have, you know, heard about Emmett Till, heard about the Mississippi Delta, know, you know, know this history. Um, I was concerned that I needed to give them more. I need to give more context, more, more stage direction. And so I probably, you know, um, I probably did too much <laughs> uh, in terms of you you know using words and it and that took takes away then from the images but I think um, given um, you know I think given the importance of the story and getting the story right um, I'm okay with maybe you know take you know you know, having, you know, more words on the page versus fewer. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, we should give uh, David Dotson credit as your co-creator oh, yeah. on the yeah. project for the illustrations that accompany the mm -hmm. text itself. So um, really does seem like a, a very intimate uh, collaboration process that you, that you. Oh, yeah. Hear. I, I know David well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, for, for a, a project that's taken several years, you know, oh, yeah. so many years to, to mm -hmm. come to fruition, um, that, yeah. that back and forth must have been really kind of a fascinating part of how you came to tell the final version of the story through, through the, uh, the illustrations as well as the words. So, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, sure. But we, we both have teaching commitments and uh, other obligations to, uh, to attend to this afternoon. So I thought I'd wrap up with one, one question that kind of goes back to the 50s and also uh, thinks about the present again. Um, you did a recent interview for Facing History and Ourselves, and you talked about Clara Looper as an educator activist in her role in launching the Oklahoma City sit-in movement in August of 1958. And you connect that in your timeline to other events in the mid-1950s, like the bus boycott and, and voter registration activism in the South and, and so on. Would you say there are some exemplary educator activists in 2020 whose community engagement inspires you? Yeah, I mean, there certainly are. Um, and, you know, most of them are going to escape me um, at this moment. But, um, you know, I would say individuals that really have inspired me by not only their depth of uh, empathy and activism on issues that matter to me, but also the deep intellectual work that they've done. Um, you know, an individual like, uh, and this is a, someone that most people will know because he's always on television, but someone like a Cornell West, um, who um, just has a deep, deep sense of deep humanity, a deep intellectual, intellectual well, as well as a deep commitment to being out in the streets, being amongst people, fighting for justice, loud and proud. Um, he's definitely someone that um, I admire and aspire to be. Um, there are also, um, you know, there are, I mean, there are just, there are just, just a lot of, you know, activist intellectuals like, like a Cornell West that don't get as much attention you know, someone that's trending now, I think, is uh, an Ibram Kendi, who's, who's um, you know, who's, who's at Boston University and, and leading an anti-racism institute and, and has written, you know, beautifully about anti-racism. You know, those are the kinds of individuals who are, you know, um, deep thinkers, um, historians, and figuring out ways to leverage this deep knowledge in ways that can push forward, um, you know, issues today. Um, you know, and there are, I'm certain, I don't wanna seem to be leaving out, um, you know, females or African-American women. There are certainly many of those, um, you know, I think of Akeisha Blaine, who's at the University of Pittsburgh, who's done great work um, on sort of, helping people to understand the traditions of African-American women as activism that are international in scope. Um, there's just so many uh, that are, the work that they're doing, the attention that they're bringing to the issues, it's just extraordinary. Um, um, but those will be just the people who are at the top of mind, but I know I'm, I'm missing people even in this OU community that are, are doing great work. Um, you know, my colleagues in, in African African American studies are certainly doing great community engaged work. But, um, you know, if I were to, to talk about, you know, who's going to set the bar really high, <laughs> it would be someone like a Cornell West, um, you know, and, you know, he's, he has no, uh, he's seemingly going to be going forever. <laughs> he has no stop in him, no quit in him. So, you know, if when I'm, when I'm his age and, and I'm still as passionate as I, you know, as he is about, you know, justice and justice work, then, you know, I'll know I've, you know, I've, I've actually done something. Well, even just thinking outside of academia as well, just community activists like Tiffany Crutcher oh, yeah. here, here in Oklahoma. And, you know, um, there are so many, college students, for example, that are, that are doing remarkable work uh, in the community. Yeah. On yeah, and, I, and, I, and I will just say briefly that, you know, I've come to know Tiffany Crutcher and had, had several conversations with her and 
Um, her story is truly inspiring. I mean, the way in which she's, she responded to the wrongful death, shooting death of her brother by police, uh, her twin brother by police, um, has just been amazing. Uh, she's in a, sh in a few short years established the, uh, the Terrence Crutcher Foundation as an as a local as a statewide as well as a national organization fighting for uh, criminal justice reform um, and and the eradication of police brutality, particularly against black bodies. Um, you know, she took all that pain and hurt um, and has found a way to try to create transformational change. And she and now this. Her, that that foundation is has support from some of the biggest foundations in the country, and it's it's, it's having a tremendous impact uh, in Tulsa and elsewhere. And so she is certainly um, to be commended. And I keep telling her, "Put me to work. Put me to work. Give me something to do." Um, and she says, "You better stop saying that because I'm going to give you something to do." But, um, and then I would say also Miles Francisco, who um, is an OU, uh, recent OU grad, um, who um, is very involved in, I mean, pretty much all the things that any activist um, initiative in Oklahoma City or Tulsa, Miles is likely a part of it. Um, and, you know, I had the great pleasure of witnessing him at a, uh, at a Black Lives Matter rally over the summer uh, in the wake of um, George Floyd's murder. Uh, I had the great pleasure of hearing him speak and hear him, you know, his impassioned calls for justice and holding police and the police, uh, you know, police departments ac accountable. Um, and I just, you know, I just remember looking up at him on this makeshift podium uh, just in awe of what he was, you know, just how he was connecting with the audience and how he was such in control of himself um, and the moment. And I just sort of, you know, was just so moved by, you know, having been able to just touch him lightly, um, having him in classes um, and, and just sort of seeing, you know, his maturation and growth in public. It was so special. And I know he will be someone who for years to come, he will be at the center of the most important activist movements uh, locally, statewide, as well as nationally. And so there, there's a lot of, of credit and there's a lot of, uh, of um, people that could be pointed to as inspirational um, you know, if you got, if we had an hour long conversation, I just start <laughs> talking about them, but for sure, you know, Tiffany Crutcher and Miles Francisco are, are people that are doing amazing things locally. Well, once again, um, August 28th this Friday marks the 65th anniversary of Emmett Till's murder. Uh, the book is called The Murder of Emmett Till by Dr. Carlos Hill and, and David Dotson. And thank you again for your work on this book, Carlos. Thank you for your time today. And I hope it's well read and, and widely read and well received in the world and as it deserves to be. So um, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me on and allowing me to share a little bit about the book. I really appreciate it, Daniel. And take care. We'll be, All right. we'll be in touch. All right. Take care, Daniel.